The Lord be with you. Welcome to Oxford United Methodist Church. Today is the final of our union worship services with Oxford Presbyterian Church. It has been such a joy to be worshiping with you these four Sundays in a row. It was a great thing to get back to and, and to, to be able to enjoy uh, one another's presence and to enjoy some great preaching by Pastor Mark especially. So I want to thank you for attending this morning for our service. And as we get into our service this morning, we do have a few announcements for you. Number one, inside your bulletins this morning, you will find a yellow card. If you would take some time this morning to fill that out. And if you have any prayer concerns or requests that you want to make this morning, you can write those on the back side of that card. And you will take this along with any tithes and offerings that you have brought with you this morning and place them in the baskets at the conclusion of the service. Those baskets are located at the rear end of the sanctuary next to the doors. Now, uh, because we're having union worship services, that means um, for your prayer concerns, we'll make sure that the right prayer concerns make it over to the Presbyterian Church. If you write those in this morning, if you're a part of the Oxford Presbyterian Church, um, and also with your tithes and offerings, anything uh, that is written by check or in an envelope that belongs to your church will make its way to that church. But any cash offerings will go to the congregation that is hosting for that Sunday. Now, we also have another important insert inside your bulletin this morning. Uh, an urgent request for some blood donations, which will be at Oxford Presbyterian Church on Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. They are currently looking for 35 people to fill those spots. Uh, so if you have some time on July 5th, please do so. And note at the bottom of this that everybody that signs up to donate blood between July 1st and September 1st will enter into a drawing to win, potentially win, Tickets to see Taylor Swift. <laughs> so, I'm trying to like nudge you a little bit in that. I know for some of our youth, they're going on a youth mission trip this week. Uh, but I'm sure that if you uh, look at all the uh, dates that they have for the Blood Center for donations, you can sign up for further dates as well if July 5th does not work for you. Um, but we cannot stress the need enough that uh, this is an important cause to help uh, with blood donations. That is actually all of the announcements I have for you this morning, but we are glad this morning to welcome up Megan again. Megan and Gina who are up here to share the missions moment, so I'm going to invite them to come up. And I'll also say that during the service you'll probably hear Megan translating, uh, whispering uh, to Gina this morning to let her know what's going on in the service. Uh, so we are so glad that she is here to share this morning. Good morning, Char family. Um, <laughs> What almost is, can we say buenos dias? <laughs> Thanks. Very good. Es una gran alegría para mí estar en este lugar y traer un fraterno saludo y muy cariñoso de la Iglesia Séptima Presbiteriana de Barranquilla, Colombia. It's a great joy for me to be with you all this morning and to bring good tidings from those in the Seventh Church in Barranquilla, Colombia which the Presbyterian Church has a sisterhood church, or has a sister church with the seventh. My name is Gina Mairena Zavala. Um, I'm psychology. That's all she knows in English. Sirvo a Dios trabajando con niños y jóvenes desde las tres áreas de mi trabajo. So she serves God in three areas of her work as a psychologist. Básicamente la comunidad cristiana Bethesda, eh, nuestra iglesia séptima, 
en Barranquilla, presbiteriana, y el Colegio Nazaret. So she works in the Bethesda Community Center, in the church, and in the school that she works at. Crecí escuchando hablar de nuestra hermandad y hace dos años tuve la oportunidad de conocer algunos miembros de la iglesia. So she grew up hearing about the partnership and two years ago had the opportunity to spend more time with members of our church that traveled down to Barranquilla. Hermandad que por la gracia de Dios en febrero del 2026 eh, cumplirá sus 30 años de hermandad. So this sister ch church relationship, by the thanks of God, will be celebrating its 30-year anniversary in 2026. Ese hermanamiento ha sido una gran bendición para nuestras vidas, para nuestras comunidades. Eh, nos ha permitido vivir en unidad, en medio de diferencias, en medio eh, de que podamos aprender los unos de los otros. Eh, y esto también permite eh, que fortalezcamos nuestro compromiso en nuestra misión como iglesia. So this partnership has been a blessing for both communities um, as we share our lives together and our faith. It doesn't matter the differences between us, but the love of God is shown through the missions of both churches. Sus oraciones, su apoyo y su colaboración han sido fundamentales para el desarrollo espiritual y social de nuestra comunidad de fe en Barranquilla. So, your prayers, your thoughts, your help has been fundamental in uh, developing the relationship in the faith in our community in Bethesda and in Barranquilla as a whole. Sí. Oh. <laughs> Hoy les traigo Mark, do you want to come up here? Este símbolo. Thank you, Mark. Traigo este símbolo so, en donde colocaron sus manitas los niños más pequeños de mi iglesia y dentro de la cruz están los deditos índices de algunas mujeres que son líderes en nuestra iglesia. So here I bring to you all a gift from our church in Barranquilla. It has the handprints of the youngest kids in our church as well as the fingerprints of the women leaders throughout our church. Así es. Esto para que siempre que lo vean puedan recordar en todo momento eh, nuestro hermanamiento y que como hermanos siempre podemos crecer juntos y ayudándonos los unos con los otros. So she hopes that every time we look at this we remember that we are together in Christ and that we will continue to develop the relationship between the two churches. Y para terminar quiero compartir el versículo que es mm, lema en nuestra hermandad so to finish up, she wants to share the um, theme of the partnership. Que dice, para que todos sean uno como tú, oh Padre en mí, y yo en ti. Que también ellos sean unos en nosotros, para que el mundo entero crea que tú me enviaste. Esto lo encontramos en Juan 17, 21. So, the Bible says, I pray they will be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. I pray that they also will be in us, so that the world will believe that you sent me. John 17, 21. God bless you in the tent. <laughs> Thank you. So much. Uh, one other thing, uh, at the near the end of the service today, we will be commissioning our youth 
uh, group as they are going on their youth mission trip. I also forgot to mention that we do have a nursery for our really young kids. It has a live stream of the service if you want to take advantage of that at any point in the service. Otherwise, the children will go out to Children's Church uh, after the children's message today. Well, that's all of our announcements for you. Would you please rise in body or in spirit as Frank comes forward to lead us in our call to worship. Let us join our voices uh, in alternate fashion as we call ourselves to worship today. I will be offering the words of light print as one voice, and we'll all respond together as many voices with the bold print. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. Let's remain standing now for our first hymn. As you remain in your posture of worship this morning, would you join with me as we pray together our collect, which is printed in your bulletin. Almighty God, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, open our eyes to your presence and make us more responsive to your call, that we may grow in the wisdom and grace you offer us. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Love that. Love that response. So, hi, my name is Taylor. For those of you who do not know me, I'm the children's minister here at Oxford United Methodist Church. I am so grateful and blessed to be here today and to have all of these lovely new friends with us today. So today I'm talking about one of the fruits of the Spirit. I'm talking about self-control. I'm talking about self-control because I am currently in my life trying to dig deep and show my self-control. As of two days ago, I took a new job. I will be working with the YMCA in Colerain as their new family life director. Don't worry, I'll still be here on Sundays. But I will be moving on from the Boys and Girls Clubs of Hamilton. And my current self-control, I'm doing really well since I just told an entire room of people. 
But aside from that, I have told no one. So you are all the first to know other than my mom. And it's so hard because all I want to do right now is tell everyone who's important to me. I want to thank everyone from Highland for all of their support. And I just want to go around and tell everyone how excited I am. But right now I have to wait. And I can imagine that my little friends down front, we may not love to wait for things. Right? Like, like on Christmas, if you walk downstairs and see all the presents under the tree, I bet the first thing you want to do is run over and start opening them, but you know you have to wait. Maybe you have a soccer game this afternoon. I see some people in soccer jerseys. And maybe you're so excited to go play your soccer game, but you have to wait. Waiting. Waiting when you're young is so difficult. When you ask your mom, are we there yet? And she says, not yet. How much longer? How much longer do I have to wait for something? And when I think about waiting, I think about my best friend, Jesus. And I think about how when Jesus was on the cross, he had every ability to just say, okay, I'm done with this. This is painful. I'm tired of this and to just walk away. But he knew he had to wait. He knew what was waiting for him. He knew that for all of you guys, he had to wait. So I'll read you a verse. It's Hebrews 12, 2, and it says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. And when I think about that, I think about those moments, the little moments where you have to wait for something. Or if you want a cookie and you ask your mom if you can have a cookie and she says, not until after dinner. That was like my least favorite thing as a child. You'll spoil your appetite. I'm always going to be hungry for cookies, spoiler alert. But sometimes you have to control that want, that desire right in that moment, and you have to wait. So how do you do that? I like to ask God for help. I like to ask my best friend Jesus. He did a really good job of waiting. He did a really good job of keeping himself exactly where he knew he had to be so that he could end up beside God. And so when I think about this job or when you think about something you don't wanna wait for, something I'm just so excited to start this job or I'm just so excited to tell everyone about it, but there's a reason for the wait. It's going to turn out better in the long run. If you can wait, if you can ask Jesus for the patience to wait, another one of our fruits of the Spirit. If you can ask Jesus for his help, if you can control yourself to be able to wait and to focus your sights on Jesus instead, if I can lean in and know that there's a reason he wants me to wait, if I can lean in and know that he waited so I can wait, because he waited to do the most powerful job of all, I can wait to do mine. And you can wait to do yours. That cookie can wait till after dinner. You'll get to the soccer game, and I'm sure you'll score lots of goals. But right now, focus on the moment that you're in. That's a message for the adults, too. Focus on this moment right now and loving Jesus, loving those that are around you, meeting new friends. Don't take it for granted because it'll be gone before you know it. And Jesus wants you to wait, and he wants you to sit in it and to love him and to wait beside him to end up beside his father. Okay, I think Pastor Caleb will pray for us and then we'll head out to Sunday school, okay? All right, well, before our children go off here at Oxford United Methodist Church, when we pray, we just extend our arms out as we pray a prayer of blessing over our children. Lord God, we give thanks for your son, Jesus Christ, that he endured the cross for all of our sakes. Be with our children as they go to learn more about your love. Strengthen them in your love and help them to grow in wisdom and patience and self-control. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen.
As we come now to the time of our prayer together, we invite you to uh, enter into the spirit of that whole thing. Uh, we have candles prepared on either side of the chancel here. If you would care to light a candle in further expression of your prayers, we invite you to feel free to do that. You'll see others uh, in line to do that. If, you, if this is new to you, just get in line, watch how others do that, and it'll all come very naturally, okay? And then after the uh, candles have been lit, uh, then we'll uh, share in uh, a little further in prayer and conclude with the Lord's Prayer together. All right? Let's be in prayer, shall we? New every morning are your mercies to us, O God of goodness and grace. By the mighty strength of your creative hand, all things come into being. By the sustaining power of your holy presence, the earth and all the hosts of the heavens, both near and far, find their places within your design. You alone are God, the Almighty, over all that our eyes can see and all that we do not and cannot see. Because of who you are, we come before you with our worship and our praise, our adoration and our gratitude. There is none else holy as you are holy. May your great and awesome name be praised in all the earth. May your great and awesome name be praised in the fellowship of your church. We are assured of your presence with us as we gather in the name of Christ our Lord. For your redemptive interest in each of our lives, we give you our thanks. May we open our hearts before you in this hour to listen for your message of hope. 
As did your people in ages past, we wish to embrace for ourselves the claim that we too, by grace through faith, are members of your flock, the sheep of your pasture. Just as your people of old, we know all too well our own penchant for venturing from your chosen path for us. Search our hearts, O God. Open our eyes to see our lives as you see us. We are yours because you befriend us, calling us into your fellowship. May your Holy Spirit awaken us to new awareness of your redeeming love, the love and grace that is greater than our faults, failures, and falling short of your purposes for us. In your great mercy, O Lord, draw us near today. Open our eyes not only to the difficulties, troubles, and ailments of our lives, but also to the possibilities of what our lives can become as we walk with you in faith. O oh God, your ear is surely attentive to the prayers of all who gather today and all who call your name in prayer. Hear our prayers for the sick and broken among us, for those who travel, grant traveling mercies, for our children and youth, grant them safety and guidance, and hearts that seek wisdom. For the aging among us, keep us true to your claims upon us. This week is our national observance of our political and governmental independence. We pray for our leaders, and we pray for our men and women in uniform. We pray for our country, even as we also pray for other nations embroiled in turmoil, just as is ours. Grant us wisdom and courage to use the influence we have to help resolve the problems we face. Let us live as the peacemakers that Jesus spoke of. May we live into the new identity you offer to us, and so live day by day as your children. Hear these in all our prayers today, O Lord, as we now join our voices in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Today's reading from the Holy Gospel of our Lord comes to us from the record of St. Mark. We'll be reading from chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. Let us listen for the good news for us in these words. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and pleaded with him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from a flow of blood for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, If I but touch his cloak, I will be made well. Immediately her flow of blood stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my cloak? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the synagogue leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the leader any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the synagogue leader, do not be afraid, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the synagogue leader's house, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make such a commotion and weep? 
The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talithakum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they over, at this they were overcome with amazement, and Jesus strictly ordered them that no one should know about this, and he told them to give her something to eat. With this, we conclude our reading for today from the Holy Gospel of our Lord, God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Frank. Good morning, everybody. It's, it's wonderful to be with all of you this morning. Uh, I want to echo the very kind words that Pastor Caleb shared uh, a little earlier this morning as we come together for this, our fourth and final Sunday together for our union worship. Uh, these, these series of four Sundays together have been such a gift uh, for all of us at Oxford Presbyterian Church. Uh, it has been uh, such a joy to, to get to join each and every one of you and, of course, to welcome you into our church what was it, uh, three and four Sundays ago. I need to do the math for just a moment there. Uh, but our fellowship together is such a joy. And such. I'm, I'm a little sad to see this come to an end because this has been so much fun and so meaningful. So thank you for your warm hospitality. And thank you, Frank. Uh, where, where, where's Frank? He was right there. There he is. And Frank, thank you for offering our reading this morning. Uh, the scripture reading that Frank just offered uh, that the lectionary has provided for us contains two stories from the Gospel of Mark that both have to do with touch. Many years ago, I read an article uh, about how psychologists had speculated and theorized for decades how children might develop if they were completely cut off from touch and human relationships through their most formative and developmental years. About 35 years ago, uh, unfortunately, they sadly discovered the answer to that question. Uh, after uh, Nikolai Ceausescu fell from power in communist R Romania, it was discovered that the state had mandated a number of orphanages for unwanted children. Prior to the 1980s, the state issued bizarre mandates and social policies wherein children would be cut off, kept completely isolated, receiving no human contact no human affection and not even human touch throughout these early years of their lives. The results, these accounts read, were heartbreaking. They could not speak. They could not relate to others. They could not give or receive affection. Although the children grew into physical human creatures, the report says, they did not become human persons. The witness of our Christian faith is that human beings were not created to live in isolation. From the very beginnings of Genesis, God says it is not good that the man should be alone. We were created to be relational people. As I learned more about these stories, I came across an interview from, uh, from the BBC with a man named Isidore Ruckel, who had grown up in one of these orphanages. At the age of 11, a family in Southern California adopted Isidore. It was, very, it was difficult pretty quickly, actually, he said. I could not adapt into a family environment. My mind was just so used to living in the institution. I was desperate to go back to Romania. I became angry. I became bitter. I even wrote letters asking the workers if they would let me stay with them until I was 18 years old. Every single one of them said no. I went back to Romania, he writes, in 2001. I went to meet my birth family to search for answers. We also went back to the institution where I grew up. I tried to understand my mom. I tried to get to know her. But unfortunately, not every parent wants to be a parent. If I'd never come to America, he writes, I would either be on the streets or absolutely dead. Every city I went to in Rome, into Romania, when you see a grown adult sitting or standing, rocking back and forth, or doing something that only an institutionalized person would do, you could instantly recognize, he writes, that that person grew up in an orphanage. As I watched this uh, program and watched this gentleman speak uh, during the interview, it was remarkable to me how far, at least it seemed to me, that he had come. 
From what I could tell, his presence and mannerisms were not so different from mine. However, for him, he said the reminders never really fade away. I do miss the institution sometimes, he said. People don't understand that because they've never experienced it. It's what we're used to. That's where we grew up. That's our home. What does it mean to be made whole? Over these past four Sundays of our union worship together, we've been exploring this theme of interruptions. And in this particular passage, Jesus himself is interrupted by a hemorrhaging woman who reaches through the crowd to touch the hem of his cloak. If I but touch his clothes, she says, I will be made well. From the point of view of this woman, her whole life has been interrupted. Now, when Mark says hemorrhaging woman, it's important to be clear, this isn't just some woman who's on her period and a bunch of ancient people back in Bible times who don't understand what that means. Verse 25 tells us she has been suffering from an irregular, constant flow of blood for 12 years. This is not normal. And Jewish law pretty clearly differentiated between these two things. And this would have been considered ritual impurity back then, according to custom. This means that she would have been perpetually unable to even enter the synagogue. Now imagine, imagine for a moment, if you had received a devastating, life-altering diagnosis, and on top of having to live through the unthinkable, you were told that you were also now no longer even allowed to go to church. It's almost unimaginable to even think about. And even if her community was filled for, with compassion and overlooked this, this was a pretty remote, small village after all. Maybe they didn't get to the temple all that often. There's still other problems on top of this. The text tells us that she's very poor. She had endured much under many physicians. She had spent all that she had in verse 26. So her health care costs have driven her into financial ruin. And I suspect she probably wasn't that exorbitantly wealthy to begin with. And Mark's gospel doesn't say this, but I think it's important to remember this is a very patriarchal society back then. We know this. Women were considered second-class citizens at best and property at worst. If there was a husband or a father figure in the picture to vouch for her, that would have probably gone a long way. But there's no indication of that in this text. In all likelihood, she was moved to the margins of society with no money to speak of and quietly abandoned. Like Isidore, she had been completely cut off from any kind of touch or human contact. Because according to Jewish law, touching a woman, uh, or anybody for that matter, who was considered unclean, well that automatically made you unclean. In one devastating moment, her entire life is turned completely upside down and, and has never been the same since. She's not dead, I suppose. But like Isidore, one wonders to what extent we can really call this living, either. In Christian speak, we often talk about uh, Jesus completely conquering what we refer to as the forces of death in his victory on the cross. And I used to hear those words and associate them with that which is trying to kill us. And that's probably true. But as I've gotten a little older, I've come to understand those words a little bit differently. There's an awful lot in this world that doesn't exactly kill us, but still gets in the way of what we would call really living. People like Isidore and the woman in this story were not physically killed by the circumstances, but their lives, their daily living, the very ways of what it means to be a person have been interrupted or, or arguably in some cases cut off entirely. When this woman <clears throat> reaches out and touches the hem of Jesus' cloak, the text says, immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? 
Now, first of all, I love how he, G, G, Jesus, even Jesus is not entirely sure what has just happened. For a moment, Jesus is not sure what's going on. And Matthew jumps in two verses later as the narrator to say that when Jesus asks what's going on, he's not just putting on a show. He genuinely has to look around to see what happened. Three Sundays ago, Pastor Caleb referred to some of these interruptions in our lives as holy interruptions. And not all interruptions are necessarily holy. Sometimes a traffic jam is just a traffic jam, as Pastor Caleb said. But here, Jesus recognizes that something holy is going on. Jesus recognizes that God is up to something. God is at work in and through this. And, it's t and, and, and we all probably better pay attention to this. And if even Jesus can be interrupted, then certainly so can we. Now, according to custom, if Jesus was touched by a woman like this, he would have been considered unclean. But instead, it makes her clean. It's a complete reversal. Throughout this entire story, Mark has been calling her woman. But when Jesus speaks, he doesn't call her woman or second class citizen or property. Jesus calls her daughter, a child of the living God. He publicly and visibly vouches for her humanity and restores her back into the community. This isn't just a story about physical healing. It's also a story about this woman no longer having to live in isolation, no longer having to be alone. The powers of death or whatever you want to call those kinds of forces in the world have interrupted her life and now Jesus has interrupted them back. As Christians, we, of course, proclaim that in the fullness of time, Jesus interrupted death in the resurrection and in the empty tomb. But stories like this also proclaim that Jesus interrupted death in smaller ways, too, throughout his life and throughout his ministry. <clears throat> For Jairus' daughter, who is quite literally, it seems, brought back to life, and for this woman to be restored fully into her community, into her neighborhood, to her temple, that is to be restored to life. This week, as, as I was thinking about this text, I was curious to learn what had happened to Isidore Ruckel uh, and what his life looks like today. I hadn't read about him since I first read that article many, 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 many years ago. So I decided to get on Google. After leaving home at the age of 17, Isidore was, was able to reconnect with his adopted parents. He has since written a book and produced a documentary about his experiences growing up in the orphanage and has become an advocate for other orphans like him. His journey has not been an easy one. However, slowly but surely, Isidore has worked to find restoration in his own sense of community. I believe that even the brain cells that don't work as a child, he writes, can develop as a grown man. And it turns out there may be some truth to that. As more research has occurred over time, more and more scientists are finding that the brain may have certain remarkable ways of rewiring itself as a way to try to compensate what has happened during early development or neglect. <clears throat> I realized what love, what compassion, and what affection can do, he says. Is this wholeness? I don't know. I suppose that's not for me to say. I suppose that's a question that only Isidore can answer for himself. But I think perhaps, at the very least, it seems to me, it is death interrupted.
And maybe that's the gospel claim really in a nutshell right there. Death interrupted. We as mortals cannot wave a magic wand and erase the powers of death, the powers of neglect, the powers of injustice, of violence, of poverty, of hunger, or addiction. We cannot wave a magic wand and erase these things from our community here in Oxford. We can't erase them from our nation. We can't erase them from our world. But we can be part of God's good work that seeks to interrupt them. We can do the good work of seeking to address them in our community, in our nation. We can proclaim that through Jesus Christ, death has already been interrupted. And that as long as there are children in this world like Isidore, as long as there are women in the world like the one in this story, as long as there are siblings and people here in Oxford, in the United States and overseas, whose lives have been interrupted by death, then the work of the church, both Methodist and Presbyterian alike, is not done yet. The God of Scripture is not finished with us yet. The God of all creation has called us to go out and proclaim the good news where we see it. The good news of death interrupted in word and deed until the day may come when all of God's children are made whole and when all of God's creation is at peace. May it be so. To God be the glory, now and forevermore. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> o gracious and holy God, we proclaim that you have indeed interrupted death in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ. We proclaim that we have, in, in the witness of the empty tomb, death was not only interrupted, but conquered and overcome. And so, God, we we ask that you would continue to guide us as your faithful disciples as we are part of that good work today of proclaiming that good news that death is interrupted, that we may be part of the work of interrupting the powers of oppression, the powers of injustice, the powers of violence, the powers of sin, that we may be part of the work of healing and mercy, reconciliation and peace that all of our lives in this community together would be a gift and an offering of joy and praise and glory to you. We ask these things in your name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is hymn number 593 in your hymnal. It is Here I Am, Lord.
Amen. You may be seated for a moment. We're going to get you standing up again here in a moment. But can I have all of our people that are going on the youth mission trip down to Henderson, if you would come forward this morning. And actually, I'm going to invite some of your family members to come up, too, because they're going to lay hands upon you guys as you come forward. So family members, don't be afraid. Come up here. Stand in for uh, those who are going on this trip. Last summer, our youth went on the mission trip to Henderson Settlement, which is down in the hollers of Kentucky. It's about a five-hour trip from here. And when they were asked where they wanted to go again, they wanted to go back to Henderson Settlement. Uh, this is a pretty impressive thing because when you go down to Henderson, there is no like cell phone coverage or anything down there. You're completely cut off from the world, um, but it is a great opportunity for them to go and to bless the lives of people down there who desperately uh, need the help. And so this morning, we're going to commission them by praying over them. And so just like we pray over our children when we bless them, would you extend your arms this morning as we pray a prayer of blessing over our youth and their leaders who are going. Guiding and loving God, empower these people to be your hands and feet today. Help them to glorify you by serving others. Send them to help those who are in need. By their actions and words, make them witnesses of your great love and your passion for rescuing your people. Lord, we ask that you would protect them, that you would teach them and support them as they become the people that you have called them to be. Fill them with your Holy Spirit and enable them to complete their tasks faithfully and joyfully. And Lord, we ask that you would bring them home safely and let their experiences further enrich us so that we too may glorify you by sharing the love of Christ. Give this team strength, wisdom, patience, and love for the work that you have given them to do as they go to serve the Henderson community. Lord, we pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. And we ask, friends, that you would be in prayer for them uh, all this week as they are serving people down in Henderson. Um, and if you want to, go up to them after service and thank them for being willing to go and to serve. You guys may go back. I see Reed was halfway to his pew already. So. <laughs> and now would you rise in body or in spirit as Mark comes forward to lead us in our cult. I mean, not our call to worship, our benediction for this day. Well, friends, when we talk about being sent out into the world to do that good work, uh, God's good work of proclaiming in word and in deed, that the gospel is death interrupted. That's exactly what uh, our youth are about to do uh, on, on this very trip. So uh, may God's blessing be with all of you. And may God's be, blessing be with us as we too go out into the world, into the business of our day-to-day -day lives in our own community, to proclaim through the witness of our lives that good news. And friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, be with me, and be with all of us this day and every day, now and forevermore. Amen. And before we leave, may we make ourselves an offering to God as we sing our doxology together, hymn number 95. 